Okay, so I think we'll go ahead now. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining today's session. I'm Nicola McCormick. I'm COO for Pro Manchester, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on human-centered digital leadership. So just a few points of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. Feel free to use the chat function as we go along to ask any questions, make comments or observations. If you can keep your microphones on mute, unless you're asked to unmute yourself, that would be fantastic. But as I said before, it'd be lovely for you to have your cameras on so we can see your faces. Um, the session this morning is being delivered by Lisa Kidson from the Citizens Advice Wigan Borough and Brian Nick sorry, Dr. Brian Nicholson, Professor of Information Systems at Alliance Manchester Business School. So without further ado, I'm delighted to pass you over to Brian. All right, thanks, Nicola. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, thanks for coming along everybody and great to meet you. This is gonna be an informal session today. Um, I'm just a uh, couple of minutes to introduce and then we'll, we'll get on with it. Um, the title, SMEs Recovering from COVID-19, Human-Centered Digital Leadership. I'm Brian Nicholson and Lisa um, will be the star of the show today as far as uh, uh, giving us the material for, for our discussion. Uh, the emphasis here is on a discussion. Um, we're opening this up and facilitating a discussion, really. We're not, you're not here for a lecture. Um, we do understand that you've been facing unprecedented challenges, and I don't run an SME, so I don't fully understand what that's been like, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to hear what you're going through and help you to manage those challenges as best we can. And um, what we're going to focus in on is this idea of digital leadership. Uh, the strategic use defined there is a, a strategic use of a company's digital assets to achieve business goals. And uh, Lisa and I met a few months ago at a, a conference um, focused in on third sector digital leadership. And we wrote this piece about digital leadership and the lessons that that could, the third sector could give to the commercial sector. And that's what we're going to focus in on today and the particularities of, of your challenges and how you can uh, deal with those challenges in this return to the new normal, taking on board the case study of uh, the citizens' advice. So without further ado, let's get on with it. Um, the first part of the day, of the hour that we've got together is from Lisa. Then we've got uh, some breakout rooms. I don't know how many we'll have. Um, two or perhaps three, depending on who to, how many show up. What we like to do in those breakout rooms is for you to discuss this, the, this, the advice, citizen advice case and bring to the fore the challenges that you're facing. And Lisa and I and will move around the, the rooms. I've also asked uh, my colleague, Adrian Quayle, who's an IT consultant for Avasan, to join in as well, to help us answer any questions. And then we'll come back into the uh, into the main session and if someone from each of the, the rooms could then summarize what was discussed and we can have a conversation about what we can do and how to follow up. That's pretty much the order of what we've got to offer you. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now and I'll pass over to, to Lisa. My turn now to share. Okay, so there Okay, right. Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. My name is obviously, as uh, Brian said, is Lisa Kidston. I'm Chief Officer of Citizens Advice Wigan Borough, which is based obviously in, in Greater Manchester. Um, I have been uh, a Chief Officer there for seven and a half years, but I've actually been in the uh, Citizens Advice Service since 2003. So. 17 and a half years. I started off as a volunteer and basically I've just worked my way through and done pretty much every job going um, that's, that's available uh, within the service. So this morning, just a very brief 
slide on uh, citizens advice just in case you're not aware of, of the service um, it's been around for a long time it opened um, or 200 bureau opened at the end of, or at the beginning of world war ii uh, the day after it was declared uh, 200 citizens advice bureau opened um, and it was aimed at, at dealing with the advice needs centered around issues such as loss of ration books, homelessness and evacuation. And then uh, as time wore on a little bit during the war, debt became a, a major issue as families lost their breadwinner to the war effort. And then by 1942, there were 1,074 across the country. This is now reduced down to about 260 due to um, lack of funds. So as I said, Citizens Advice Wigan Borough is a member of Citizens Advice, which is almost like a kind of umbrella organisation. We're not any kind of government department. We're an independent registered charity. Uh, we were incorporated in 1989, although there has been a Citizens Advice around Wigan since, again, 1939. Most of my um, role is about sourcing and applying for funds. We are grant funded uh, although we do have one contract uh, but really it's it's constantly looking to find uh, where we can get more money from to keep going um, and the, the other aim of citizens advice as well is to fight social injustice to improve the lives of our citizens and we provide quality assured information and advice to um, anybody irrespective of who they are and what they need and then the, say the advice is free, impartial, independent and confidential. And I've just put a little picture up there, which I, I really like, which was from the, the early 1940s of the, the earliest advice bus, all those uh, in a horse box. So just moving on from horse boxes to digital. So for Citizens Advice Wigan Borough, digital is the primary focus for our post-COVID service delivery. And when I'm talking about digital, I'm talking about things like our core infrastructure, the equipment that we use, the PCs, the laptops, networks, etc. Um, using productivity tools, uh, apps for word processing, presenting, making spreadsheets, communicating and collaborating. So examples of Google Workspace, Microsoft 365. We actually use Google and have done for a new number of years. Oops, sorry, I'm clicking too far there. Um, and also our sort of customer focused digital offer as well, which is around websites, social media and video, which enhances and extends the service availability beyond that usual office nine to five hours. And it gives more choice on how clients can actually access our services. Now, reliable cloud solutions enable better efficiency and collaboration. Without the productivity tools, it's much harder for staff to work efficiently and effectively. And traditional document storage and retrieval systems create data silos and actually hamper that ability to easily share documents. And that's uh, something that we realized a few years ago, which is what I said, we kind of moved away from that traditional server model um, over to Google, which enabled our staff who worked in outreaches um, to easily uh, access documents and that before they had to be in the office to access or carry it around on a pen pen drive or something. Um, to ensure effective collaboration though, we do need to be able to seamlessly communicate and utilizing available communications apps such as Google Chat, um, video conferencing does support the removal of communication barriers. Um, and as I just alluded to earlier as well, it's also great for connecting remote workers. Um, some of our outreach workers who never really worked in the office have now been they're now in the same position as the rest of our staff who are working at home and they've actually said that they now feel more part of the team because of, of all the um, sort of collaboration tools that we've decided to utilize but digital technology isn't just about the platforms and the tools that we use but it's also about how we use them strategically now and in the future and in a way which is empathetic to the needs of our staff and clients when we first went into lockdown, it did require for us quite a cultural and digital transformation. And as I said, although we did um, had started to use digital technology better and we did have plans to increase how we use digital technology, 
lockdown meant um, for us that we had to bring these plans forward really quickly. So the move from office to home was really difficult for some people. And we had to be really creative in, in the way that we responded to staff wellbeing, recognizing that their wellbeing was essential to ensuring that we were still able to offer services to clients. So we had to stop all of our face-to-face -face provision. Obviously, everything um, had moved over to telephone uh, and staff were, were all working at home. Before they actually started working at home though, we undertook individual home risk assessments to make sure that they had all the equipment that they needed. Um, I spent a lot of, of the first couple of weeks of lockdown traveling around the borough, delivering desks and, and dismantling office, our office and taking it to different staff members, monitors and everything else. Anything that we could do to support them to work as safely as possible um and still be able to say help the clients we also agreed work plans with all the staff to ensure that they actually understood what the expectations were um, in terms of them working at home but also who to raise any issues or concerns with and we, we did have a number of staff who were really worried about being isolated um being away from from their colleagues in the office so we implemented daily virtual meets um, and it was just an opportunity, 10 minutes every every afternoon, people could make a coffee, have a chat, and it was entirely up to them. Uh, it was just an open drop in, but it, it did give people that opportunity just to say hello to the colleagues um, and actually see them face to face, albeit remotely. Uh, and, but also a minimal number of staff have continued to attend the office two to three days per week, really for their um, mental well-being. We also have individual catch-ups via chat and video uh, on a weekly basis so that we're, we're ensuring that we are monitoring staff wellbeing. Um, with, we know that if staff aren't feeling well mentally, then that is going to affect their, their motivation and productivity. So it's all about encouraging them um, and, and supporting them through what have been some really, really difficult times. In terms of recruitment, that's actually gone um, a lot better than we ever anticipated. So it, this is probably something that we'll continue to do um, going forward. It does enable us at the moment to recruit people from further afield. And also we utilize um, Google Forms. So we set practical exercises as part of the selection process. Uh, and then we've been, say, conducting the interviews using Google Meet. Feedback has been generally good about it, although you do need a fallback in case of internet problems. Uh, training new recruits, though, has been a lot more difficult. It's been harder for them to feel part of a team when they've never met them in person. So what we've done is implement a buddying system. So all new um, recruits, all new staff members, are allocated uh, a buddy from the existing staff workforce who can help support them through those early weeks of, of finding the feet and, and getting to grips with new organisations, sort of systems and procedures. I've talked a lot about staff wellbeing and, and the reason for that is I mean, last year, stress, depression and anxiety caused by work has accounted for 17.9 million working days lost which is a huge amount. Because we are really mindful of staff health and wellbeing, we introduced health and wellbeing workplace ambassadors. So we have two members of staff who are uh, mental health first aid trained as well. They are both allocated uh, two hours each a week out of their normal work just to support other staff. Um, and, and some of it's very practical tips. Uh, last week in the staff meeting, we did 10 minute chair yoga, which was interesting and fun, I think. Um, but also they can support people just, you know, be a listening ear, act as a conduit between the staff member and the line manager if needed. Um, and they're there really just to pick up uh, early on any potential issues that might be arising with that staff member. For us, prevention is the key. 
So if we can can keep the motivation up, keep the productivity up, um, we're going to get much more out of them ultimately. And life at work is going to be a lot happier for, for the staff. We've also encouraged um, around about a quarter of our workforce. So we have uh, 38 members of, of paid staff at the moment. About a quarter of them have disabilities. So we've encouraged them to apply for access to work and we've had loads or they've had loads of support through that. So from things like uh, standing desks installed in their in their homes, you know, really posh massaging the heat generating chairs, um, software such as um, Dragon Speak so they can uh, talk to the computer and it'll type for them. All different kinds of training for line managers and team members. And all that has been paid for by the Department of Work and Pensions, which is so if anybody does have any staff with disabilities, I highly encourage you to um, encourage them to make an access to work application. In terms of clients, we've extended the way in which clients can access advice. Obviously, we've had to move away from that traditional face to face service model. Um, so just being mindful that not everybody can get through on the telephone um, or, you know, it's not always the, the best option for people. Then uh, there's a secure website contact form that we've set up. Uh, we use social media a lot as well now. Um, we can do advice via email, web chat and video. And we use a secure video platform. Um, and it's a, a mixture of either virtual drop-ins or virtual appointments. And we've actually had some really good feedback on that. Um, we've actually put a, a video up on our YouTube channel from a client who's uh, provided a testimonial about how easy they found that to use. Um, and clients can also send documents to us via WhatsApp so they don't have to go and post things to us again. Things we know can be lost in the post, particularly during COVID. It, postal service has been really um, disrupted so this way at least they know that we've had the documents that, that we need in order to be able to help them. And during all this time so from April last year to the end of March this year we've actually still managed to deal uh, with 38 members of staff plus two volunteers. We've dealt with 14,000 or just over 14,000 client contacts and 35 and a half thousand issues. And our advisors have actually helped clients to gain or maintain an annualized equivalent of 4.6 million pounds in income. And that's just Citizens Advice Wigan Borough. So that's money that's actually coming into the borough as well. And that's as a result of, um, I believe, all of the measures that we put in place to help maintain staff motivation, productivity, make them feel valued. Um, and they delivered really. Over the last 15 months, we've also taken the opportunity to embrace change and innovate. And it has cost us very little. Um, we've made most of free and low cost options to improve staff and client engagement. We've undertaken surveys so that we can understand the client preferences um, and generate ideas for their development. We, we've looked at how they can um, access us better and we've been, in, say, implemented different ways for clients to reach us, just utilising mainly those kind of social media website and, and apps that are available. The collaboration has been um, key uh, to helping us make these improvements and we are working with other non-profits, public and private sector, to help meet significant barriers to access. So if all these different options we've put in place, there are still clients we know that can't access us because um, either they, they don't have the equipment or they don't have internet or whatever. So we're in the process at the moment of trying to set up digital hubs across the borough. We just opened our first one last week. We're working with um, a local community centre. We've set up equipment within their centre uh, which clients can then just access at any any time it's open and it will link straight through to us and, and join one of our um, video drop-ins. We also use re internal resources. So university and work placements are really, really good. 
for helping us do more work without actually um, having to spend a fortune that we don't have. So they can help us do market research, um, help us do you know website design upgrading. Uh, depending on the length of the placement, we can also get them trained up and doing advice as well. But that also provides them with opportunities to enhance their own CVs. So we're taking that from social responsibility. We also look at how we can give staff responsibility. So opportunities, as I say, to, to act as a workplace body or be one of the workplace ambassadors. And by doing that, we're, we're empowering them and we're enabling them to develop as well. And we can also learn a lot from, from our staff. So we identified that um, we, didn't, we weren't getting very many young people engaging with our service. Um, and we, we wanted to understand why and what were the best ways of accessing them. So we put a little working group together of our younger members of staff um, so that we could understand the best social media platforms to use and, and, and what the tone of the messages and things like that should be. And we use obviously apps a lot, so these productivity apps. Doodle uh, saves time going back and forth between multiple parties to arrange a meeting. Um, I'm a big fan of, of a Chrome extension called Toby. Instead of having 20 million tabs open, I can put them all in all in this one um, uh, extension, whatever it's called. Um, there's Trello, which is an online collaboration tool. There's Todoist. Um, using, because we're, we use Google uh, Workspace, then obviously we also use things like Jamboards which is, is like a virtual um, stick it note thing that you might use to do it when you were in person doing it um, on, on sticking notes on walls and whatnot. This allows you to do it remotely. And there's a lot more information about um, apps and the top apps that, you, that are available um, and for a variety of purposes on different tech websites. Um, and I have got a slide at the end which lists all the resources um, that I use and that I'm aware of that either provide low cost uh, or free um, help and support as well. So I think that's going to be shared with you later on. So we're actually currently in the process at the moment of moving our telephony as well to soft phones. For us, it's actually a cheaper option than mobiles. And then as, as that sort of um, filters through all the staff, we will then replace all of our desk phones or, or just get rid of all of the office desk phones. So when the staff are back in, they will just use their soft phone, which is basically um, telephone over the internet. And, and hopefully that's going to save us uh, a significant amount of money each year. So my next um, and final slide just provides an overview of key considerations for moving forward. So in order to meet staff and client needs, we need to understand their frame of mind. We know that many people have been maintaining social distance and are still hesitant to venture out. So we need to, to be aware of what risks might be available and control those risks. Um, and reassuring staff and clients that the needs can and will be met, although it might be in a different way to before, but we can still support them and help them. Um, in a safe way. And then just for us, keeping a, monitoring those risks and, and ensuring that those controls uh, are still effective. But also part of supporting staff, there's kind of an ethical responsibility as well. So I've talked a lot about the support that we've given to our staff, um, but other organizations, other companies um, are also aware of, of this sort of ethical responsibility. For example, before we, uh, before COVID, we were working with Heinz who'd identified that there was a lot of staff absence um, due to, to sickness. And they had a concern that a lot of it could well be debt related. So we, uh, they invited us to um, go in on a monthly basis and just do an advice surgery. So their staff could just nip out, come in, see us in, in a, a room that was set aside and get some advice for free without actually having to leave the work premises as well. So it wasn't really taking too much out of their day. They weren't having to take annual leave or anything like that to come and get support in our office. 
And that's something, again, that we've been looking to increase going forward um, as we start returning back to face-to-face -face advice as well. Um, but then there's also a sort of a philanthropic aspect. It's about giving back to the community. For example, allowing staff to spend time volunteering, allowing community groups to use a room for free, um, or sharing resources to save money. And I think that doesn't just need to be third sector doing that. I think all of us can, can look at different ways that, uh, and learn by what's happened uh, over the last sort of 15, 16 months um, and support each other. I think by supporting each other and sharing resources, knowledge and expertise, then that's the best way we can have of actually moving forward. As I said, there's a, a slide there which will be shared with you later, um, which has got sort of different resources around free and low cost learning, uh, productivity suites and apps, and, and then there's managing people. I've included the access to work link, the fact sheet there for employers as well. Um, and hopefully you'll find that those are useful to you. Okay, thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Okay. Oh, that's great. I'm just thinking with the numbers on the call, should we stay in the same in the same location mm -hmm. and, and run this as a Q and A? Mm -hmm. We were going to have breakout rooms now, uh, but we've got nine on the call that I can see. So four of us are presenters or um, organisers or advisors. Uh, so let's just do it here. I mean, what I suggest, if you'd like to, if anyone that's on the call would like to ask something or say something or introduce a particular challenge, um, put something in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute and just introduce yourself, say hi, and uh, we'll try and help. Hi, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Ralph, I work at a Blue Chip in Manchester. Uh, you'll have to excuse me not having my video on, I'm having a bit of a hay fever disaster this morning, so I thought nobody wanted to see me sneezing every five seconds, but I'll leave it on for now. Okay, tell us, tell us about your, your challenges, uh, Ralph. So it's quite interesting for us because we've had pretty much the same challenges as it sounds like the CAB's had. Um, we were traditionally uh, an offline business, well, not an offline business, but we were very office-based, tied to chain, chain to desks before the pandemic. Uh, we very luckily got everyone laptops about two weeks before, we, before the pandemic hit. That was just pure, pure coincidence, not, not by any stroke of planning or anything like that. Um, but... We've had to get onto Teams and everything. We've had to adopt Office Microsoft 365. We did consider Google, um, ultimately, with the server network we use, which is better, more efficient for us to go mm -hmm. to the office. Um, we've had to put smart soft phones in as well. We've had to, um, effect effectively, it was quite interesting just to hear back everything the CAB's done because that's pretty much what we've had to do. And uh, I mean, I'm not the ops director there, luckily, because uh, she's had a bit of a, a nightmare for the last 12 months. So. Uh, she's actually retiring in two weeks. I don't think it's related, but that's uh, yeah. It's, it's been a it's been a challenge for everyone. There's a lot of challenges, and it, it's refreshing to see that other businesses, whatever scale they are, are having exactly the same problems. Yeah. Anybody else got any other questions or thoughts about moving forward? How you, know, you might plan on on post COVID working? Um, yeah, sorry. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Neil. Yeah, yeah. Neil McLeod from Virgin Money, or who was previously Yorkshire Bank. Um, but I, I, I guess one of the challenges we've had and continue to have is confidentiality is, is key to a client confidentiality, key to, key to our business, as I'm sure it is with Citizens Advice Bureau. And in, in the old COVID world, pre-COVID world, we had set ways of doing things so that we could observe confidentiality and, and regulatory challenges. Mm. I suppose, question to you, how, how did you guys overcome that, given that you, you were moving to, to new, untested platforms? Yeah, um, and that was a key consideration for us, because obviously clients wouldn't come to us if they didn't think things were going to maintain 
uh, carry on being confidential. So for us, it was really, it, it was already really embedded in staff anyway. So, you know, even in the office, we had clear desk policies and ensuring you lock your computer if you're stepping away from your desk. So really, it was reiterating those. I mean, for some staff um, who preferred to take notes, we actually bought them shredders so they, they could shred any documents at the end of the day. Um, but virtually everybody else is used to using Google, so everything gets typed and, it, and it's in the cloud or whatever. And it's just constant reminders about um, following the processes, being aware of the who's around them and potentially looking over the shoulder you know I suppose I just on, on the processes did you have to reinvent many processes or were you able to just keep going I think we were pretty much able to keep going because I think the processes that we had were pretty robust um, because they also covered us doing outreaches before so you know sometimes we would be in partner locations so they were already used to being really aware of what was around. Um, the main thing was just reminding people that unless they had access to a shredder, they couldn't take notes. But we also had to do things such as um, if their printer was on the network, was, was the printer capable of storing data? Um, so that meant our IT had to go and check a few. Um, because we were just a bit hesitant to, you know, sort of rather be safe than sorry. So it was things like that. Um, also things like, you know, not having um, Alexa and Amazon Echo devices switched on and things. Because right. again, it's amazing how much phones and, and Amazon and Google seem to pick up. Um, so some of it was, those were new things for us. Um, and just thinking about what, what else in that, in, in that home environment might be able to pick up on what's being said. So, you know, being very clear that if they didn't have a physical space that they could take themselves away from um, any other family members or whatever, then they would have to maintain working in the office, um, which is why, as I say, we, we did a couple of days a week, people still came in because of mental wellbeing. Um, we didn't actually have any situations where people couldn't take themselves away to somewhere private. Um, and also having people um, working at home just means that they can, it's constant reminding about it. And there's been a couple of blips, I'll be honest. They've been very minor, fortunately, and it's not something that would necessarily have been any different had they been in the office so things like you know sending a document out to a wrong address fortunately it wasn't uh, um, a sensitive document or you know it didn't have any client details on but there there's nothing different that could have happened in the office as well um, but also the other thing was things like any things that did go out and, and need printing we only have one person who's able to do that so instead of having a team of, of four admin who used to do all the posts and everything we locked it down to one admin who had the most secure setup around them um, and they had the printer and this literally we just hired a photocopy and a scanner and printer and sent it to their house um, the main thing, as I say, is just and also insisting that if they moved house or if they um, needed to, you know, somebody said, I've had a, an emergency in the house that they might have to move me into a hotel. We've done separate risk assessments. So every time they've moved, we've done a risk assessment to understand what is the setup around them. And I think that's the most important thing is just keeping it current all the time. And, and drumming into them if anything changes whatsoever you've got to tell us and that seems to have worked for us great thank you anybody else i've just got a couple of things if, if we're all right for time um, yeah, so my name's Abby. I'm from uh, Forbes Solicitors. I think like everybody else, we've had, um, you know, whilst there's definitely been some advantages of, of working from home and having, you know, your workforce at home, there's certainly been some challenges. 
And I think for us, um, one of the biggest challenges has been really our office is sort of the hub of our firm, if you will, where you know, everybody comes together to collaborate and, you know, innovate and just lift, you know, everybody's spirits. And I think although we've tried to put, you know, things in place, like having, you know, a virtual coffee morning where, you know, you just log on and you, you grab a coffee, your, your breakfast, and, you know, you just chat and try and, I guess, replicate what you would do in the office. Um, it, it's not the same when, you know, you're like this and you just sat at home and you're, you're speaking to your computer screen. Um, so I feel like that's definitely been, you know, a challenge for us and, you know, trying to, I guess, still keep that, um, you know, that, 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 that hub where people go and, you know, you or switch off from, you know, being at home all the time. Um, and then I think the other issue um, that I'd be interested just to see if anybody else has had similar, you know, challenges or if there's any advice from, from this point of view is, um, that very, you know, the blurred line between home and work. Um, and I think whilst a, a number of people in the past were, uh, you know, businesses were perhaps sceptical about allowing people to work from home because they think, you know, you're just going to be sat watching TV or, you know, what they're going to be doing, they're not going to be working. Actually, um, you know, we're finding that, there are, you know, because you've not got a commute and because you, you know, you get out of bed and you, you just sort of log straight on. You know, me personally, I know I'm starting work a lot earlier than I used to. I'm probably working, you know, a lot later. I'm not necessarily taking a lunch break. Um, clients, they're now starting, you know, at way before nine o'clock, whereas previously it wouldn't be the case. And I guess it's any tips for me of recognising that, but also trying to then manage that across your team. So I think some of it has to come down from the top. I, prior to, you know, to working at home virtually all the time, I was a real workaholic. I was in the office at half seven every morning and I rarely left before seven o'clock at night. And actually, since we've been at home, I, uh, as a leader, have made a conscious effort to sign on and sign off at, at different times. And we use Google Chat, so everybody virtually signs on in the morning. We just say, good morning, hi, hope your day goes well. And then again, we say at the end of the day. So that enables us to monitor how long people are working for a start off. Um, and we can pick it up and say, you seem to be on really late last night, or, you know, you are having your lunch breaks, aren't you? Think. But by um, showing the staff that I'm also, I'm not, I am starting later, actually, because I can take the dog out for a walk first properly, and which is great for me. Um, and I'm, I'm being very vocal about that. So, yeah, I'm off for a walk this morning. I'll see you all on nine o'clock or whatever. Um, and then I'm leaving as well. And some days I do put in long hours, but then other days I'll say, I did really long day last, last yesterday. I'm going to leave at two o'clock today, guys. And, and demonstrating by example that it's okay to do that. Um, we've just been having a bit of a conversation at the moment with staff who, one of the, I mean, chat's great, but there is that other thing where it's pinging constantly. So we've said to people, it's absolutely fine to mute yourself or to mute rooms. If you're in the middle of a, if you're in the middle of a task, mute yourself. We're not going to be offended. Um, and, and that as we've given them permission to do it. Uh, but a lot of it is leading from the top. Um, we do, as I say, monitor who's coming in and, and who's coming out not as a monitoring tool as you know in a bad way but to make sure that they aren't um, working till silly o'clock but other other the, right at the very beginning I insisted that everybody got up and got dressed as if they were going to work as well um, I was like right and, and again I do the same which I always used to do any, anyway um, and also the Days can be extended, so before it used to be sort of half eight or half five, six o'clock, whatever. For some people who maybe had to do homeschooling with children, um, we took the decision early on that they could extend their working hours till maybe nine o'clock at night if needed, 
um, although you know they had to monitor and make sure they were still getting their 11 hours break. Um, but that's allowed them to dip in and out during the day as well, maybe to do some family commitments and then come back into work. And as long as the clients uh, are still getting a service and as long as we're still meeting KPIs in, in terms of our funders saying how long we have to be on the phone for or whatever, that's absolutely fine. And, and it's, a lot of it is about changing that culture from the top down and showing that it's okay to, to stop working. And on a Friday, we have um, a quiz after work. So again, that makes certain anybody who wants to join the quiz, you know, they have to quit working. Um, and that's always a bit of fun as well. Yeah, so. well, that's great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Emma. I work at the UK Advisors. We're a mortgage brokers. Um, my main challenge is we're quite a small firm. Um, we've adapted to working from home quite well. Um, my main challenge has been um, a few members on my team um, have been disgruntled, if you like, because some have been distracted with children at home. Mm. Um, I've had to move, sorry, because I've got a child at home isolating. Um, so I've just come out of the way. Um, so my main um, issue this past 12 months has been some of my team um, don't have children, don't have distractions at home, are very much focused from the, the nine till five. And then I've got a few members of staff that have children at home. I'm, I'm one of them. Um, I'm lucky that my husband was furloughed. So um, we sort of took care of the children while, while I worked undisturbed. Um, but I just wondered how other people, if anybody's health has that issues and, and kind of how you made people happy in a way that, you know, others are still doing the work. They're just like segmenting it into time. Um, it, was, it was just one of my biggest challenges, I would say, that I've had. Anybody else got any thoughts on that? I, I can actually give you some quite good insight on that because we have quite a large, um, a, lot of our, a lot of our employees are, you know, have got young families, they're all working at home. And what we found to do that worked the best for us was saying to people, look, if you want to start at seven and work till, you know, four, do that. If you want to start, if you want to fit it around your childcare, we, we found that rather than trying to make people fit to us, as long as we got the results we wanted, we don't really care what time they work at as long as we Yeah, so, so we did that. It was more that the other staff members thought that they were not working and could see that they weren't online when, when they should have been because of their working hours. And why aren't we allowed to work at those hours if, if if they are um so it's more um trying to appease i suppose um the staff members that don't have children and that don't have those um, at home distractions well in terms of what we did at pro manchester we made it very clear across the boards because we had the same we had some people with children some people without children so we made it very clear that we were um, being flexible to everybody yeah. and then what hours people were working so if they were logging right, on at okay. seven and logging off at 10 for a few hours everybody knew that and then right. everybody was communicating with each other right so okay it's very, yeah it's that honesty I think yeah being um, transparent I suppose across yeah exactly yeah. but then we did allow that flexibility to everybody um, just because of mm. mental health and everything, making sure everybody is taking a break and they're not working through. And um, we'd always say, right, I'm going for a walk now. Make sure the rest of the team know that and try and encourage that within the team as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. And then my next issue that we're coming up against now is we're still um, home working um, for them. I'm not. I, I'm only at home because of isolation, but um, we are back in the office um, more often than not. Um, and a few of the staff members are reluctant to come back to the office. Um, they don't feel the need to come back to the office. Um, we we want the team back. Uh, and like like the other lady said, it was very much you know what have you done this weekend or you know let's get a brew together, catch up in the morning. Um, but a few of them are, are no, I can't come back. Um, it's too unsafe. And um, there's too much COVID around. Um, but yet we're seeing their behaviour on social media that's quite the opposite. Um, in the, they're quite clearly not that concerned with COVID. Yeah. They were using it as a reason not to come back to the office. 
Um, so that's a bit of a, has it, hey, has anybody else had that? And, and how do you approach that one? So it's, it's um, interesting and, and social media sometimes is very handy. Yeah. <laughs> Things yeah. pop up and you're like, oh, didn't realise they were doing that or whatever. Um, and I know that one of my staff members has, has really been very vocal about how hesitant he is to return to the office. But to be honest, yeah. he hasn't left the house hardly yeah. in 15 months. Yeah. Um, and I know that he's really worried and all what we did was um, when we were preparing after the lockdown last time, we were preparing to move back to the office. So we put screens up and everything. And yeah. I, we did all the COVID secure. Yeah. Things. yeah. I wrote an entire process of who did what during the day, how many times we'd be cleaning, what we'd be cleaning, how it would happen, um, hand gel, thermometer, everything. Yeah, and we did video walk arounds with staff before they came in, so that they could actually see what processes we'd put in place. So it started to make them feel a little bit more secure. Um, we've been very, very firm about when staff move around the office, they have to wear a mask. Don't care if they've got an exemption. Yeah, for for the two minutes it takes to maybe walk to the kitchen or walk to the toilet, they can wear a mask or a face a visor, because that yeah. then makes other people feel confident mm -hmm. or, or more. A lot of it is just reassurance. We understand your concerns. This is what is in place, and being really confident that what you've got in place is absolutely more than sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And clearly communicating what you've done. Ultimately, if they refuse to come back in, then you're looking at potentially going down a, a disciplinary route. Okay. We want to try and avoid that as much as yeah. possible. Yeah. So we've been very the other thing is just, just a, a quick question there. And I understand, you know, people might want to get back in, but is there any way to do hybrid working? It's something that we are definitely going to carry on doing. So they'll be in the office a couple of days, two or three days, but they'll also get the opportunity to do home as well. Yeah, so that's, with the, the one in particular, that's what we're doing with her at the minute. So she's, um, we agreed that she would come back two days a week um, and she comes in on the day when the other girl's not in. So um, we've created like a work bubble, if you like. Mm -hmm. So she's only in with the same people. Um, it, you know, it's very, very secure. It's, it's it, we're following every guideline that we, we possibly can. Mm. Um, but for the last three weeks, there's been an excuse why she can't come in. Um, but it's very apparent that she's she's not quite adhering to social guidelines. Um, and that I think is just going to have to be yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Um, so it's just a case of of um, I think we're going to have to approach it somehow with her and say. I've been, you know, I've seen what you're doing on Facebook sort of, of thing. Um, but I think it's it's just she wants to be at home and that's not um, not what we want as a, as a mm -hmm. we want everybody back in. Yeah. You know, get back to some, some degree of normality. Yeah. Well, I had a staff member who walked back in um, and I said, where's your face mask? She said, I've got an exemption. I said, I don't care. I've seen the Facebook pictures of you visiting your mum and you get in the nursing home. You were wearing a mask then, you can wear a mask now. Yeah. Um, and it is a case, sometimes you do have to be firm. and cool. bit, bit blunt, yeah. Because yeah. it's not just that individual person, everybody else is seeing how you're dealing with it as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, if you want to keep the whole office morale up, everybody yeah. has to be dealt with fairly and consistently. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if it actually helps the sort of discussion, but maybe just a sort of observation that, that I've made, really. Um, and one is that, that actually the company that I've been working for for, for a good few years that, that Brian mentioned, it's a, a, firm, a firm called Avistant. And we're a small global management consultancy and set up, um, you know, about, about 15 years ago. Uh, but we've actually got people all around the world. <laughs> So they had the sort of head offices in Los Angeles. We've got people across the United States. We've got people here in Europe and we've got a significant office in India. And, and this method of working, you know, the way of working we're doing now, we've actually been doing since the company was founded because the team in India 
primarily were a, a remote working back office operation. And over the years, things changed because actually, um, you know, the, the staff in India, you know, you know, you know, were excellent, you know, sort of excellent consultants. And what tended to happen a little bit was that people then started working in the US and actually we've got a few people who've also come to the UK as well. Um, but the, the standard method of operation was always remote working like, like we're doing now. And I must admit, you know, and obviously we've been working for, you know, large companies and organizations in Europe and, and the US. Now, I, we'd be doing a sort of hybrid working type situation where perhaps I or other colleagues would be face to face with the client here in the UK or, or in the US. But actually a lot of the work was done by people who were working remotely. And um, the question was always asked, you know, like we've just been saying now, well, how do you know these people are actually actually working for us? How do they know that they're, they're not sat, sat at home, you know, watching TV or whatever? But of course, the reality is that the guys were probably the hardest working individuals you know, because obviously in India, any um, core business time is relatively antisocial. You know, if they're working with the, the, you know, the Americans, then they're actually work, working into the evening. Um, if, if they're working with us, you know, then there's only about half the day which, which actually has an overlap. Um, so they spend a lot of time actually doing what we would regard as relatively unsocial hours, but that's almost the norm, the, 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 the way it's actually worked. The thing that I found really interesting is that um, there's a concern that, um, you know, what, what we're doing now is actually... Um, uh, is, is actually a bit of a challenge when I can see that actually we had a way of working which was exactly like this. And in a way, the whole world has moved to a sort of a common business model, which is, you know, remote working, which is hybrid working. I mean, going to the office for us was like a, a once or two year flight to, the, to sort of Los Angeles. It wasn't, <laughs> um, you know, walking down the road and going into Manchester or whatever. Um, so that's the way we've had to work for a long time. And we actually seen in the corporate sector, a lot of people were actually sort of working like this anyway. I mean, yes, obviously some of the big organizations, you know, there was a, a, a be in the office um, sort of culture, but we were very much seeing, you know, people moving moving more towards this, this method of working. And, and clearly, you know, when, uh, you know, the pandemic struck and suddenly overnight, <laughs> I mean, all we did was we converted from Skype to business to Teams, which apparently we would have had to do within a month anyway, <laughs> because Microsoft were changing the model. Um, but what I've really been amazed at is the way huge numbers of very small organizations very quickly have actually done the same thing and got up and running very, very successfully. So I think the, the, the way forward definitely will be a hybrid working type uh, model. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we perhaps need to sort of accommodate that. I know that it can provide some um, personal challenges if you are, you know, more used to um, a nine to five office working type culture. But I, I actually think that, that what we're doing now is, is really the way we're actually going to be working going forward. And certainly what we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years, out of necessity, you know, if you've got people in India, UK, America, across the States, you know, there's no way you can be... Um, uh, you know, sort of working in a, a single office location. So, uh, I mean, I, you know, I actually think that, um, you know, people might feel, you know, if you're in a very small organization in one location, that maybe this is, um, um, you know, this is actually um, tough. Um, is I think it's actually the, you know, the way we're going to be working as a norm going forward. Yeah, I think more, I, more, I, more of an observation than Neil, you know, yeah. Sorry, guys, I'll jump in and give my own thoughts and observations on this as well. And, and, and I think um, it, it goes back to it's made in that article that came from, from Forbes magazine, I think, and also some of the points that Lisa was making earlier on. Now, it, th this is what I think that the past 12 months, 15 months have forced some organisations to do is, is grow up and actually realise that they can trust their staff. I guess if, if I roll back to, to the start of proceedings in, in my organisation, what, what, what we found, what we knew in fact was that it, it tended to be the senior people or more senior people in the organisation were trusted with laptops, with, were trusted with mobile phones, had the ability when required to work from home. But then it became apparent that really everyone 
needed to work from home, but more junior members of, of the team would historically be strapped to the desk. They'd have desktops rather than laptops. And, and over a, a period of time, the bank realised, my bank realised, yeah, we've got to give these guys the, the technology that they actually need so that they, they can work from home. That was always resisted in the past, but, but it's been done now. And, and I think what we found is it works. People can be trusted. As you suggested, your colleagues in India, well, you know, they weren't pulling a fast one. They, they were working. Uh, as I think a few people have mentioned, just because people have got kids, just because they've got to go to hospital appointments or whatever, doesn't mean that they, they, they won't put a shift in. So um, there is an element of trust and a, a I suppose I'm harking back to 15 months ago or more. Many organisations weren't prepared to take that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. But now they've had to. And I think the ones which have done so are probably reaping the rewards. I'm sorry, I do apologise for being late. I, I, it's very interesting to hear what people are saying. I think, I think what maybe some people have forgotten is that is that agile working has been kicking around for for donkey's years and 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 and, and low well, I mean low level less well paid people have been working from home for donkey's years you think of call centers okay so i don't i don't think yeah there's partly issues about trust there's partly issues about confidence the whole sort of you know am i going to sort of die or possibly die or spread something but you know, for me, having worked as a project manager in local authorities in a previous existence, it, you know, the key thing for me is that people aren't being communicated about the change that's happening and, and nobody likes change. You know, that for me is a key thing. You're nodding there, Ralph. Do you disagree, agree or? Sorry, I meant to shake my head in agreement with you. But not like <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just I'm just aware of people's you know reaction sort of thing. Yes, yeah, so, so so for me, it, it's a huge it's a huge communication issue, and 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 yes, I I think there's going to be a hybrid model. I think the challenge is is that nobody knows what a hybrid model is because everybody's being led by. Some company saying, oh, it's going to be 70, 30, or it's going to be this, that, and the other. And essentially, it's going to have to be customized, isn't it, based on the based on the business requirements yeah. and based on the on on the um demographics of the actual staff, because you know, I'm, I'm going to take a very stereotypical one. You know, younger people want that sort of office mentoring, meeting people environment sort of thing. And 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 when we rolled out agile working. Uh, in local authorities, you know, we, we wrote that into the H and R, uh, HR rules. At the end of the day, you know, it, 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 there has to be a business push, but it has to sort of involve staff so that they can contribute and and and, and ultimately work towards something that works for everybody. Yeah, I just to jump in. I mean, I agree with Peter that uh, communication is key. Um, um, to all of it, uh, trust. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit surprised sometimes that people talk about trust because by default I do trust my uh, team members um, because they have chosen the job for a particular reason. And I'm working quite often with uh, remote teams, and I have to deal with them remotely. So um, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of. Uh, management by objective. So where oh, the communication is absent. Sorry? Ah, um, so where um, communication is key so that everyone is clear about the targets to be achieved and then to deal with it on a regular basis on an iterative uh, um, time scale. I'm conscious of uh, that we've we've overrun a little bit, folks. Um, I think uh, if I could just mention that I, th I thought the point that was made by Emma was particularly interesting for me, and in the ensuing discussion to do with expectations and the rest of the team and clear 
mm -hmm. communication of, of rules seems to be key. I mean, you, you, you've got an awkward conversation coming soon, I think, Emma, with the, the person that's, um, that's been seen on Facebook and, uh, and yet refuses to, presumably they were in pubs and social uh, uh, events. I, I think that the, the hybrid working model, certainly, if it was communicated to everybody, otherwise there's going to be a crisis of morale where uh, really interesting discussion, everybody, and thanks so much for for showing up. Um, and, and, and thank you particularly to Lisa uh, for coming along and, and sharing the insights from the CAB. Um, we've about run out of time. Will you be sharing the slides? Come yeah. back. As long as Lisa is happy, then I'll send them out to everybody along with the recording as well, so you can, can watch again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you both so very much. That's been really interesting and really helpful, certainly. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. And it's really good to see you all today. Good to meet everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye now.